Vertex form and complex roots. We talked about vertex form before. We said that vertex form is y equal a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, where the vertex is hk. If I give you an equation of y equal 8 times x minus 4 squared plus 5, the vertex in this case is the lowest value. This one is a parabola that is right side up. Remember, if you have a negative in front, that flips it. This is the lowest value you can create in this equation. And the smallest you can make this is 0. So that's when x is 4. So if you plug in 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. 0 squared is 0. 0 times 8 is 0. And y would be 5. The vertex is 8, 5. The vertex is a great way to graph because you immediately know this point once you have it in vertex form. So the question you might have is how do we put an equation in vertex form? Remember how we completed the square on the last assignment? That's what you do here. You complete the square. Looks a little bit different though because you have a y instead of a number. But just like when you complete the square, the first step is get the x variables on one side and that number on the other. So I want these things on one side, and I move the 7 over with the y. So I'm going to add 7 to both sides, and I get y plus 7 equals x squared plus 6x. Now what I'm going to do is make this a perfect square. I do need to point out that you need to make sure the coefficient of the squared term is 1. In this case, there already is 1, so you're good to go. Next, take half the coefficient of x, square it, and add it to both sides. We'll take half of 6, that's 3, square it, that's 9, and add 9 to both sides. So we take half of it, square it, add it to both sides, just like when we complete the square. So we're going to add 9 to the right side and 9 to the left side. We have y plus 16 equals, this is a standard form. I know that x times x when you FOIL makes x squared. This times this makes positive 9. So it's either two positives or two negatives. The middle is a plus, so it's two positives. Factors of 9 that add to 6 are 3 and 3. We have y plus 16 equals x plus 3 squared. And the last step is solve for y. Move that 16 back to the other side to get y by itself. Subtract 16 and y will equal x plus 3 quantity squared minus 16. The vertex in this case, this is an upright parabola, Reminder, if there's a negative in front, that reflects it over the x-axis. This is the smallest y value you can get out of this equation, which is when x is negative 3, because that makes this 0. Negative 3 for x. When I plug in negative 3 and I add 3, I get 0. Squared would be 0, and y would be negative 16. The vertex is negative 3, negative 16. Here is an example that makes a much messier solution. Let's give this one a try. Get the x variables on one side and move that 9 on the other. I'm going to add 9 to both sides. y plus 9 equals 2x squared plus 8x. I need the coefficient of the squared term to be 1. I'll divide both sides by 2 y plus 9 over 2 equals x squared plus 4x. I'm going to take half the coefficient of x. Half of 4 is 2. Square it. That's 4. 2 squared is 4. And add 4 to both sides. I have y plus 9 over 2 plus 4 equals this is a standard form. x and x. This times this makes positive 4. 
So it's either two positives or two negatives. The middle is a plus, so it's two positives. Factors of 4 that add to 4 are 2 and 2. We have y plus 9 over 2 plus 4 equals x plus 2 squared. Now the tricky part is I need to move all this back over in reverse order. First thing is to move the 4 over. I have y plus 9 over 2 equals x plus 2 squared minus 4. Subtract the 4 to move it. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. You can't distribute the 2 through the parentheses, so don't try it. Because it's squared, the exponent would have to come first. But this will make it y plus 9 equals 2 times x plus 2 squared. I do need to take the 2 to the minus 4. That's minus 8. Almost done. Take a 9 off each side. And y will equal 2 times x plus 2 squared minus 17. I now can see that the vertex would be negative 2. That's what makes 0. And negative 17. We are now introducing negative square roots, that is imaginary numbers. With imaginary numbers, i is defined as the square root of negative 1. And if I ask you to take the square root of negative 9, you're going to think to yourself that that is negative 1 times 9. I know that the square root of negative 1 is i, and square root of 9 is 3, so this would be. 3i. If I ask you for the square root of negative 100, then that would be negative 1 times 100. Square root of negative 1 is i. Square root of 100 is 10. That would be 10i. If I ask you to take the square root of negative 50, we know that 50 is negative 1 times 25 times 2. The square root of 25 is 5. The square root of negative 1 is i. So this would be 5i. Everything always goes in front of the root, so it doesn't look like it might be under the root. Left under the root is still the 2, because I couldn't do anything with the square root of 2. And 5i root 2 is my answer. We use this when solving equations. For example, if I had x squared equals negative 81, I would square root both sides. Remember that when you take the square of a square, there are two answers normally, so we say plus or minus. And the solutions then would be x equals plus or minus. Negative 81 is negative 1 times 81. The negative 1 comes out as an i. Square root of 81 is 9. So this is plus or minus 9i. If our equation was 3x squared plus 27 equals negative 54, I would solve for the square. Notice there's no x here. I don't need to factor. There's, there's no middle term. So when there's just a square, I can solve for the square. Take a 27 off each side. 3x squared equals negative 81. Divide both sides by 3. x squared equals negative 27. Square root both sides. When you take the square to both sides, there are normally two answers. We put a plus or minus to get both of those answers. Negative 27 is negative 1 times 9 times 3. So x would equal plus or minus. Square root of 9 goes out front as a 3. Square root of negative 1 is an i. And left underneath the root is still this 3 because I couldn't do anything with it. Can't take the square root of 3 unless I make it a decimal. And there's my answer. Now notice when I write this, as I mentioned above, everything goes in front of the root so that it's not confused with a number that might be under the root. We always put the plus or minus in front of the number, just like a sign, like a negative. And the 3 goes in front of the i because it's like the coefficient of i. Now that you've learned about imaginary numbers, we can have another definition. A complex number is of the form a plus bi, where a is the real part, 
and bi is the imaginary part. What you'll see is that some of the equations we solve will have imaginary solutions, like the one right there in front. Now we're going to complete the square on this. This is no y, so this is just completing the square. We're going to get the x's on one side and the number on the other. That's x squared minus 4x equals negative 8. We're going to take half the coefficient of x. That's negative 2. We're going to square it. That's positive 4. I have x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals negative 8 plus 4, which is negative 4. This factors is a standard form. In fact, it's x minus 2 times x minus 2. I have x minus 2 squared equals negative 4. At this point, I can eliminate the square by taking the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus, opposite the variable. And I have x minus 2 equals plus or minus. Negative 4 is negative 1 times 4, which is 2i. Square root of negative 1 is i. Square root of 4 is 2. Almost done. We're going to add 2 to both sides. When we do that, typically we put that in front of the plus or minus. And we say our answer is 2 plus or minus 2i. This is two solutions. One is 2 plus 2i, and the other is 2 minus 2i. And what we will see is that if you plug one of those in for x and work it all out, it will be equal to zero if you follow the rules of imaginary numbers. Something for later. Something I want you to observe. Look at the two solutions. The only difference between them is the plus and the minus. Everything else is the same. These two answers are called conjugates. The conjugate of one complex number is the, is the same number except for the i part has a different sign. What I just said is going to be important. The reason complex conjugate, the conjugate idea is important, is it turns out that every solution that has an imaginary complex solution always has a pair of solutions and one solution is the conjugate of the other and vice versa. The only difference between the two solutions will be the sign of the i term. The conjugate of a plus bi is a minus bi. The conjugate of a minus bi is a plus bi. The solutions to any equation that has complex imaginary answers will always come in pairs and one will be the conjugate of the other. If I ask you what the conjugate of 8 plus 5i is, only the i part changes. It's 8 minus 5i. Those two are conjugates of each other. And if I write it in a different order, and I don't write it in a plus bi form or a minus bi form, if I say i plus 10, you have to be aware that the conjugate is negative i plus 10. Only the i part changes. But normally we'll write it as a minus bi and a plus bi, meaning I would, I would write it as 10 plus i and 10 minus i. These two are the same though, so it really doesn't make a big difference. Here are questions from your assignment. This first one is review. It's the idea that if I have a simple equation like x squared equals 49 and I square it both sides and if I say x equals 7, there are two numbers squared to make 49, 7 and negative 7. To get both of those, I put a plus or minus when I take the square root of both sides and I say the answer is plus or minus 7. Square root solutions always come in pairs also. We'll talk more about that later. But what I'm going to do is get rid of the square by taking the square root. So I'll take the square root of both sides. Opposite the variable side, I'll put a plus and a minus. And what I have is, I'm going to turn it around, x plus 6 equals plus or minus 5. I'll take a 6 off each side. 
x will be, I'm going to pop that in front, negative 6 plus or minus 5. Negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11. And if I plug those in, the original equation, I'll see that they work. To put an equation in vertex form, you have to know how to complete the square. This question is review of completing the square. The first step is to move the 48 to the other side. x squared plus 14x equals negative 48. Now we take half the coefficient of x. Half of 14 is 7. We square it and add that to both sides. This is x squared plus 14x plus 49. Half of 14 is 7. 7 squared is 49. And this will be negative 48 plus 49, or 1. We're going to rewrite that. It's x plus 7 squared equals 1. And if we were solving it, we take the square to both sides, put a plus or minus on the 1. It would be the square root of 1, which is 1, and move the 7 over. Another review question. This one's a little bit messy, though, because taking half of 1 is a little awkward. But we will get the x's on one side. Already done. Make sure the coefficient of the squared term is 1. Also done. Take the coefficient of x, which is 1. Take half of it. Let's multiply it by a half, and I get a half. Take a half and square it. That's 1 fourth. And add 1 fourth to both sides. x squared plus x plus one-fourth equals 11 plus one-fourth. This is a perfect square and always will be if you take half the coefficient of x and add it to both sides. In fact, it's x plus a half times x plus a half. Notice that the middle term will be one-half x on the inside and one-half x on the outside and 1 half x and 1 half x make 1 x. That's the middle term. Notice that 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. This is a mixed number. It's 11 and 1 fourth. 4 times 11 plus 1 would be 45 fourths. I have x plus 1 half squared equals 45 fourths. Now I can take the square root of both sides and put a plus or minus over there. This is x plus 1 half equals. I'm going to split up the root. Up top, root 45 is 9 times 5. That'll be 3 root 5. Down below, the square root of 4 will be 2. Now I'll move the 1 half over with the square root side. And it's, I'm going to subtract it to do that. That's negative 1 half plus or minus 3 root 5 over 2. I already have a common denominator. It is 2. This is negative 1 plus or minus 3 root 5 over 2. That last question was a little messy. Hopefully this one will be a little bit easier. We're going to put this in vertex form. We're going to complete the square to do that. First step is to move the 72 over. And what I have is y minus 72 equals x squared plus 18x. Now we'll take half of 18, square it, and add that number to both sides. Half of 18 is 9, square it, we get 81. We're going to add 81 to both sides. On the left side, negative 72 plus 81 is 9 y plus 9 equals x squared plus 18x plus 81. Now we're going to rewrite it. Reminder that this is x plus 9 squared, and we're going to move the 9 over to the other side. So this would be y equals x plus 9 squared minus 9. Let's put this equation in vertex form. Move the 96 over with the y. y minus 96 equals negative 4x squared plus 40x. 
Make sure the coefficient of the squared term is 1. So I'll divide both sides by negative 4. y minus 96 over negative 4. Notice I'm not doing anything to this because I'm just going to move it all back over when I'm done. This will be x squared minus 10x. We're ready to complete the square. We'll take half of negative 10, that's negative 5, and square it, that's positive 25. We'll add 25 to the right side and 25 to the left side. y minus 96 over negative 4 plus 25 equals, this is a perfect square, it's x minus 5 times x minus 5, or x minus 5 squared. Now all we have to do is move everything back over. Move the 25 over first. y minus 96 over negative 4 equals x minus 5 squared minus 25. Multiply both sides by negative 4 to undo that division by negative 4. Don't distribute the negative 4 through the parentheses. You can't do that because the x minus would come first. Let's change colors so we don't get our questions mix, mixed up. We have y minus 96 equals negative 4 times x minus 5 squared plus 100. Negative 4 times negative 25 is positive 100. Almost there. Add 96 to both sides. And y will equal negative 4 times x minus 5 squared plus 196. This takes practice. It'll get easier with practice. Move the 7 over. We have y minus 7 equals 2x squared plus 4x. Make sure the coefficient of the squared term is 1, so I'll divide both sides by 2 y minus 7 over 2 equals x squared plus 2x. Now we'll complete the square. Take half of 2, that's 1. Square it. 1 times 1 is 1. And add 1 to both sides. We have y minus 7 over 2 plus 1 equals this is a perfect square. It's x plus 1 times x plus 1. Move everything back. Move the 1 back. y minus 7 over 2 equals, subtract that 1, x plus 1 squared minus 1. To undo that division by 2, I'll multiply both sides by 2. y minus 7 equals, don't distribute the 2 through the parentheses. You can't do that because x plus 1 is squared. The exponent would have to come first. 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 2. Do take it to the one, negative 1. Last step is to add 7 to both sides. y equals 2 times x plus 1 squared plus 5. There's vertex form, and the vertex is what makes 0. That would be when x is negative 1. When you plug in negative 1 for x, you end up with y being 5. Question 15. This one's going to be a little tougher because we have a number that's a little more difficult to take, half of in the center. We're going to have to deal with fractions. Let's put this in vertex form. First step, and move that 2 over to the other side. We get y minus 2. We have to subtract it to move it. Equals 4x squared plus 1x, or x. Next, make the coefficient of the squared term 1. Divide both sides by 4. We have y minus 2 over 4 equals x squared plus 1 fourth x. This is going to be a little awkward, but we can do it. Take half the coefficient of x. So take half, multiply by half. One-fourth would be one-eighth. Take one-eighth 
and square it. That's 1 64th. And add that to both sides. We have y minus 2 over 4 plus 1 64th equals x squared plus 1 fourth x plus 1 64th. This may not look like a perfect square, but it is. This becomes y minus 2 over 4 plus 1 64th equals, it's going to be x, and what times what makes 1 64th? Well, that'd be 1 8th. Now, undo everything and move it all to the other side. I'll change colors so we don't get things mixed up. y minus 2 over 4 equals x plus 1 8 squared minus 1 64th. Multiply both sides by 4 to undo that division by 4. Y minus 2 equals 4 times X plus 1 8 squared minus 4 times 1 64th is 4 over 64, which reduces to 1 over 16. Last step is to add 2 to both sides. I only assigned 1 like this. Y equals 4 times x plus 1 8 squared, and I'm going to plug that in the calculator. Negative 1 16th plus 2 is 31 sixteenths. My suggestion is, so you don't spend a lot of time on that, just plug that in Desmos and hit the little round circle fraction Next to it, it'll take that decimal you get and turn it into a fraction, and you'll have a nice simplified answer. Now, if you're kind of tired at this point from doing all those tough questions, fortunately, these are a bit easier. These just take seconds each. Remember that i is the square root of negative 1. Turn this into negative 1 times 169. 169 is a perfect square. Square root of 169 is 13. Square root of negative 1 goes out as an i. So this is 13i. This one's a little tough because the number's large and it's hard to find perfect squares in that. That is where that little factor table I mentioned that's on my website can be handy. I'll bring that up. I'm looking for the largest perfect square in 1,053. Ignore the decimals. I'm looking for perfect squares. That's like 4, 9, that's 3 squared. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 49, 64, 81, and so on. And I spotted 81. Not only that, it's 81 times 13. If 13 had any bigger perfect squares in it, then there would be a bigger perfect square than 81. But 13 is prime. So the largest perfect square in 1053 is 81. 81 times 13 is what I'm going to write. This is 10 times the square root of negative 1 times 81 times 13. Take that negative 1 out as an i. Take the square root of 81 out as a 9. When I take the square root of 81 out, there's times right here. So it'll be 9 times 10 is 90. 90 i root 13 is my answer. Here's a quick one. To solve for x, we get the square by itself x squared equals, take a 56 off each side. 7 minus 56 is negative 49. So I'll take the square root of both sides and put my plus or minus. And x will be plus or minus. This is negative 1 times 49 
plus or minus 7i. Now, I can't enter that in the answer, so what I'm going to have to do is enter 7i, comma, negative 7i. And that will be my answer, positive 7i and negative 7i. Notice again, imaginary numbers, complex numbers, the answers always come in pairs. That's why we talk about the conjugate. In this question, we're going to find the zeros. Reminder that the zeros, this is y, or when y is 0. I'm going to solve the equation x squared minus 2x plus 17 equals 0. Zeros are the x-intercepts, but in this case, they're going to be imaginary, and you can kind of see imaginary solutions in the graph. You get little bends, but they're actually not x-intercepts, but they are the zeros. When you plug them in, they will create y equals 0. Let's solve this by completing the square. x squared minus 2x equals negative 17. Make sure the coefficient of the squared term is 1. It is. Take half the coefficient of x, half of negative 2 is negative 1, square it, negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1, and add 1 to both sides. That's x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals negative 16. This is x minus 1 squared equals negative 16. Square it both sides and put our plus or minus. And we have x minus 1 equals plus or minus. Negative 16 is negative 1 times 16. The plus or minus goes in front of the number. The square root of 16 is 4. The square root of negative 1 is i. Last step, add 1 to both sides. And x equals 1 plus or minus 4i. This is two solutions. One is 1 plus 4i. And the other is 1 minus 4i. Separate those like with commas, like it says in the directions. And these last two take a few seconds each. Find the complex conjugate of the given number. The conjugate is when the sign of the imaginary term is the opposite. The conjugate of 1 minus 6i is 1 plus 6i. Don't be confused if they're right in a different order. It's the imaginary part that changes the sign. And what we know is that if this was a solution to an equation, this would also be a solution. Because the solutions of complex numbers always occur in pairs. And the last one. Notice the order is different. Don't be confused. The conjugate is when the imaginary term has the opposite sign. The conjugate is negative 8i minus 1. You could also write that as negative 1 minus 8i, same thing. 